Fantastic. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this evening's Wild About Devon webinar, which is being uh, convened by the Devon Local Nature Partnership. We are very honoured this evening to have not two, but three speakers uh, from the Devon Hedge Group talking about hedges, none other than hedges. Um, and uh, so it's going to be quite an exciting one. We're going to start with Rob Walton, who will be talking about the benefits of hedges for wildlife and people. Then we'll have Tom Hines, who will be talking about hedge management. And finally, we'll have Megan Gimber, who will be talking a little bit about hedge survey. So after each talk, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. We'll have five minutes of uh, Q&A. So if you just want to put your hands up and I'll call out your names and we can can fire some questions across. Um, so if I could just ask for everyone to go on to mute and otherwise we shall get started. So I need to share my screen, don't I, Rob? Yes, please. Yes, indeed. Okay. This looks like the right one. Okay, brilliant. Oh, move this out of the way. Okay, over to you, Rob. Thank you. And good evening. I hope you can all hear me all right. My broadband here is not the best broadband in the world, which is why I've asked Mike if he would kindly host my presentation for me and change the slides when I request. But it's very good of you all to join us. And as Mike has said, there are three of us from the Devon Hedge Group here at the moment. I'm the chairman and very pleased to be in that position, but I'm speaking to you from a farmhouse in West Devon. And it's really because uh, when we came here 30 years ago, I realized that we had these very fine hedges that I got interested in hedges and looking after them. And, you know, 30 years on, I'm still just as interested now as I was then. And they're quite wonderful. Uh, hedges are, you know, in, in here in, in Devon, we have really, and I really believe this, we got the best hedges in the whole world. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that is the case in a moment. Now, what I'm going to start with is talking to you for about 15 minutes about the ways in which hedges are so good for wildlife and also the ways in which they benefit us as people, whether we're farmers or in local communities or whatever. Now, it's an awful lot of ground to cover in 15 minutes. And I can't do it by any means. And I don't want to rush it too much. Uh, but if you're interested in following it up, there's a whole load of information on the Devon Hedge Group and Hedgelink websites. But I'll crack on then, because time is fairly short, and start with wildlife. Mike, if I have the first slide, please. Next slide. Is that coming up? So, haven't, I can't see it yet. Ah, oh, thank you very much. Good. Um, so, I, I start with wildlife. And just to say that, I, I think you all know this really, that most of our fields are intensive grassland or arable and actually support rather little wildlife. So on most farms in Devon, the wildlife is restricted largely to the hedges and other sim similar semi-natural features. So typically on a farm, something like 95% of all the wildlife is found in the hedges and similar features and only 5% on the open fields. And that's even though hedges only occupy a tiny proportion, perhaps 5% of a typical farm. So enormously important from that point of view. Next slide, please. And they do have, you know, the most astounding number of species they can support. So I was challenged about 10 years ago by, by a mate to see just how many different species of animal and plant and fungi there are in a single Devon hedge. And I spent two years doing this. Uh, I had a lot of help from experts. At the end of it all, I found 2,070 different species in this one Devon hedge. And that's not the sum of it all. There were lots of things that couldn't be identified, particularly little parasitic wasps. 
So perhaps 3,000 species big enough to see with a naked eye in a single Devon hedge. And that is truly astounding, isn't it? And just think then what a whole network of hedges might contain. Next slide. So I thought I'm just going to run through very quickly uh, a handful of special species that you can find in Devon hedges. And starting with the brown hair street butterfly, which is very much uh, a hedgerow species. It lays its eggs on the new shoots of blackthorn and its caterpillars feed on the young leaves. We have here in Devon a national stronghold of the species, which has declined in much of the rest of the country um, because it's thought, because hedgerows aren't managed very well there. Um, you have to get the cutting regime right, and Tom may well touch upon that. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, soil bunting, probably Devon's most special bird. I mean, it used to be a great rarity, but thanks to the efforts of the RSPB and others, is now commoner, at least along the coastal strip in South Devon. But here, it is heavily dependent upon good hedges, both as nesting sites and as song posts in the hedgerow trees. Next. And then we have the hedgehog. Well, the name says it all really, doesn't it? But this is a threatened species and declining rapidly. And we need to take care of it and obviously take care of the hedgerows, which are important for it. Next one. Uh, bats, lots of bat interest around hedges, but this species in particular, the greater horseshoe bat, I'm sure you all have heard about this. Um, here in Devon, we have some of the, well, we have the best nursery colonies in the whole of the country, and they're some of the best in the whole of Europe. Uh, radio tracking studies have shown that these bats are using hedges as navigational aids and flyways to move around the Devon landscape. They're also using them um, as feeding habitat, uh, catching the larger moths and larger beetles, which are their prey. Next slide. And then my personal favourite, because we got lots of them on the farm here in Devon in our hedges, is of course the hazel dormouse. Wonderful rodent. Um, and, you know, we, we tend to think about these things to be associated with closed woodland, but really, they're creatures of scrub and woodland edge, and of course of hedges. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a species which is declining, sadly, across the country. We've lost about 60% in the last two decades. And in fact, although Devon remains a stronghold, and we can still find this wonderful creature, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> we can still find this wonderful creature in quite a lot of our hedgerow networks. There's no reason to suspect that it's not declining here as well. And again, it's really important that we keep our hedges in a healthy condition if we're to ensure its survival in the long term. So that's a little bit about biodiversity. I'm going to now move on some of the ways in which hedges are so valuable for farmers. Next slide. So the first is crop pollination. Uh, quite a lot of research done on this, which shows that if you want healthy hedge pollination, po healthy populations of hedge pollinators in intensively farmed countryside, then you have to have good hedges. Um, and indeed, that uh, the pollinators like bumblebees can actually be effective at uh, pollinating crops like oilseed rape or forage beans or red clover in grasslands for up to 700 and feet is 750 meters away from the hedge. Next slide. But in a Devon context, it's probably particularly in the context of orchards, that hedges are so important. Here we have Monsieur Lejean in his orchard in Normandy, who was <coughs> advocating very strongly um, the role of hedges in making sure that he could a good, got a good crop of apples. And incidentally, he did produce the most wonderful Calvados. Um, but he was making the point that when the bumblebees are not visiting the flowers on his apple trees, um, then and pollinating them, then they're actually the rest of the year, they're depending very much 
on the flowers within the hedgerow, both the shrubs and the herbage margins. And that's indeed where they have their nests, both their breeding nests and their hibernation nests. Next slide. Um, so I'm just coming on now in this next slide to pest control and the fact that particularly in arable situations, hedges can be really important to reducing the need for insecticides to be applied because what the hedge is serving as is it's serving as a refuge during the winter for the predators of crop pests, things like ladybirds and caribou beetles and spiders and hoverflies, which um, will move out from the hedge where, they're, where they've overwintered and where they built up their numbers in the early spring and they're moving out into the field and gobbling up aphids and other pests over a distance of at least 60 meters and as I say reducing the need for pesticides. Next and you know again from a farming perspective hedges are really important for both shelter and shade that's both for livestock, you know, springs, uh, lambs in the spring, particularly cattle in the, in the summer, because cattle are very susceptible to heat stroke, which is why you will see them uh, seeking the shade of hedgerow trees in the summer. But also hedges are important for increasing the yield, particularly on sandy, the lighter sandy soils of uh, crops, particularly broadleaf crops like vegetables. And a hedge will actually decrease the wind speed and therefore the rate of water loss from crops over a distance of 12 times the height of that hedge. Thanks, Mike. Next slide. Um, now looking at the benefits to, to wider society and communities. I mean, hedges are now you know, much talked about in the context of natural solutions, particularly in terms of reducing downstream flooding of uh, you know, settlements. And so here we see new hedges being put in on a farm up above Braunton, uh, paid for by the Environment Agency, purposely to reduce the rate at which water runs off the land following the storms. And so it reduces the risk of surges in water courses which then will lead to flooding. Next slide. And here we see um, a piece of netting stretched across uh, an arable field. I think this is maize in fact. Um, and the netting is there to show just how effective um, a hedge can be at reducing the rate of soil loss. This apparently was after just one storm event, one heavy rainfall event, and all that soil was stopped by the netting. If it had been a hedge, of course, the hedge would have done exactly the same thing and stopped all that soil from being lost out to the sea. And as you walk around looking at the Devon countryside at hedges that contour the landscape, you will almost certainly see that up slope of the hedge is much higher than down slope because over the time the hedge has actually saved a huge amount of soil from being lost. Next slide. And then again hedges can be very effective for removing horrible pollutants like nitrogen and phosphate and herbicides um, from water before it reaches our water courses. And the next slide. And likewise they can help to keep air clean. In our towns and cities um, there's a real role for hedges, particularly if they're placed um, between the road and the pavement in actually reducing the, the amount of air that we breathe that is full of nasties, such nitrogen oxide and particulates. So a lot of talk about putting hedges into towns and cities in the right places to keep us healthy. Whilst on farms, hedges, particularly where they're allowed to grow tall into lines of trees, around intensive livestock rearing units can be very effective at remo removing ammonia. Thanks, Mike. Next slide. And all we're taught these days with, uh, you know, the climate change conference taking place in Glasgow shortly is about climate um, change and what we can do to mitigate that. 
And here hedges have a real role to play in storing and capturing carbon. Uh, it's self-evident they're going to be better at that than open fields. But just to remind you that the carbon is stored not just in the woody growth above ground, but also um, in the roots and in particular in the soil. And it's that soil organic carbon is where it is stored up for a long time is particularly important. Next slide. And so you know, just to indicate how important on a typical bit of Devon countryside, a bit of Devon farmland, and something like 13 to 38 percent, depending on the density of, of hedges and how many woodlands there are, but something like 13 to 38 percent of all the carbon stored in the hedges, sorry, all the soil stored in, all the carbon stored in the soil will be associated with the hedges. So very important. And next slide. And that's why the Climate Change Committee in their influential net zero report produced last year called for a 40% increase in the extent of hedges. Now I think they used the word extent carefully. So it doesn't just mean planting new hedges, but it also means that we can let our hedges go wider and taller, and they will therefore capture a whole lot more carbon and help to reduce the rate of climate change. Thank you, Mike. Next one. And just to remind you, of course, that hedges as well can be very good sources of wood fuel. There are plenty of um, farmhouses around the county which are heated in part, or even sometimes totally, by wood fuel taken from hedges. We heat our farmhouse a lot with wood, wood burnt in our wood stoves, which comes from our hedges. There's a lot of information on this, which is available on the Devon Hedge Group website, but it's something which we in the Devon Hedge Group would see a, like to see a lot more happening, is hedgerows actually being harvested, cropped, managed, cropped, harvested for wood fuel, a very good source of renewable energy. Thanks, Mike, next slide. So I'm moving on now towards the end of my uh, 15 minutes, just to say the cost, hedgerows are hugely important in our landscape. Just imagine what Devon would look like if it didn't have any hedges. Pretty ghastly, wouldn't it, really? I mean, we may sometimes get annoyed at them because we can't see over them when we're driving along the lanes. But in fact, away from the open moors and the close, you know, close to the coastline, they define our landscapes. And they're very important for bringing tourists into the county. They're, a lot of farms use their well hedged landscapes to help sell their products. And of course, if farm, when farms change hands, nowadays, those that have maintained good hedgerow networks are more valuable. And next slide. Um, and, you know, <coughs> historical can't really underplay the value of hedges. And most of our hedges are uh, medieval origin. They're 600 years old or more. At least two thirds of our hedges are 600 years old or more. And, you know, you can look, when you're looking at field patterns, which are because are defined by the hedges, you can really read the history of the landscape from its, from its hedges. And as Tom will, I'm sure, tell us, we have our own traditional um, hedge lane style, the Devon style. And Tom, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to tell us about that. And really, apart my penultimate slide, the next slide, is just to make the point, I, I, I touched upon hedges being important for keeping uh, the air we breathe clean, particularly in towns and cities, but also just to mention that they can provide really good opportunities um, for people um, to improve their both physical and mental health. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for local communities to actually involve with, their, with local farmers um, over hedge management. So, the local community can, with the farmer's permission, 
say, lay or coppice a hedge. And in return, they get these the benefits of the physical activity and the social interaction. But they also get um, the wood fuel from the hedge, which in these times of expensive you know, fuels and a lot of fuel poverty, that could be really important. And the farmer in return gets their hedges laid, their hedge laid. If you're interested in pursuing that, then there's a lot of guidance on how to do it in a toolkit available through the Devon Hedge Group website. So next slide. So just to conclude what I've been saying, um, I hope I've been able to persuade you, if you didn't, weren't already convinced that hedges are quite wonderful and do all sorts of good things for us. They're vital for wildlife. Um, if you're a farmer, they really do sustain or increase farm yields. They conserve our soils, they reduce our flooding, they keep our water and our air clean. In terms of climate change, they've got this real role to play in terms of carbon capture and storage. And they create healthy and beautiful landscapes. And my final slide, please, Mike, is just to remind you the heaven, the the, the heaven, that Devon has the very best hedges in the whole world. Thank you, and I would welcome any questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. That was absolutely fascinating, and um, I think just a, a really good advert for how fantastic hedges are, not just for the environment and our biodiversity, but, but for us as well. Um, I actually, I personally really, I, I've did you take the photo of the, is it the little hoverfly larvae attacking the aphid? Was that one of yours? That's right. It was in, I, I'm not very good at looking after my brassicas and I tend to let them go into flower and seed and the aphids attack them. And I was just watching, looking at these aphids and the hoverfly larvae there. And they're really quick at eating them. You know, they go scrab, suck the juices out minute later, grab another one, set the juices out. And you can see how effective they can be at, predator, at pest control. Mm. No, it's brilliant. I think we, we often hear a lot about sort of pest control and uh, predatory species, but to actually see it in action and not just a lady, ladybird was, was quite nice, so well illustrated. Fantastic, okay, well, um, if anyone would have any questions, if you want to pop your hand up, the hand function, and uh, we can, I can call you forward to ask a question to Rob, if, if anyone has any. Anne Wilcox. Just a quite simple question, really. In the hedgerow and boundaries grant scheme that's available now to, or was available, and we can start doing it now for farmers, it, it suggests that um, before you take up one of these options for laying a hedge or for coppicing a hedge, you have to take out all the elder and, and treat it. And I, I personally think that's wrong because I see elder as a as a as available for pollinators and later available for berries. So what's the, what's the thinking behind that? And how can we influence this decision, I suppose, that the that, that elders should be removed? And that's, that's a really good question. Thank you. I think th thinking is changing. Basically, elder is poisonous to other species within a hedge. Its roots actually produce toxins. And so when you tend to get an elder, you often get a gap in your hedge. Now, if your hedge is meant to be stock proof, then that matters. And so you probably do want to control the elder. But nowadays, nearly all our hedges have fences alongside them. And so the hedge isn't really the thing that's controlling the stock. And as you say, elder bushes, well, they're actually a surprisingly good early season nesting habitat for things like chaffinches, but they produce these wonderful flowers and these great berries. And they certainly have their part to play in hedges. So I certainly would no longer myself advocate removing uh, elder. I think they're, they're useful. Brilliant, thanks. Um, there's been a bit of, bit of chat in the, in the chat box. So I'll read that out if we don't have any more questions. 
John W says, if hedges are so beneficial, why have so many been ripped out in other counties? And I guess, I guess Rob or or Tom or Megan, I, I suppose that's in many ways it's it's variable across the country, isn't it? The sort of the loss of hedges, as I suspect in Devon, uh, many of them have been retained because it's quite a hilly landscape, a pastoral landscape with small grazing fields. Whereas in a lot of the lowlands, particularly where my girlfriend's from in Suffolk, they've been ripped out to consolidate into larger fields, haven't they? But is that is that a right a correct assessment? Do you think, Rob? I think it's pretty good, although in fact in Devon we have lost almost as many as a higher, as higher proportion as the rest of the country. So we've lost about 30% here, which is about what most of the rest of the country has okay. lost too. It's just that we started with a lot more. <laughs> so it still appears that we've got a really well hedged landscape and indeed our networks are pretty intact, which is amazing. But they have been removed partly because agricultural machines have got a lot bigger but also it's only recently really that we've realized just how important hedges are for wildlife and also the benefits they can bring for farming and it's that recognition which is leading many farmers now particularly in arable areas in the east of the country to put the hedges back again mm -hmm. it was a mistake to take them out I'm still having that battle with my, my girlfriend's um, father who, who still runs a farm and I was down there not that long ago and he'd taken out part of his hedge, which was very mm. disappointing. So, uh, you know, it, it still does go on and even with people who uh, should know better. So um, do we have any more questions from anyone for Rob? Hannah, I don't have a surname for you, but Hannah. Hi. Um... So I'm involved with the Tree Warden project in, in Torbay um, with uh, Torbay Council and the Tree Council. Um, can we connect that with um, repairing, re-establishing or, or establishing new hedges? Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Hannah. Um, the, the Tree Warden Network is, I think, you know, real, really important, real allies in this, particularly in the context, not of just of making sure that we retain the hedges that we have, but also in terms of encouraging hedgerow trees. Now, I haven't talked about hedgerow trees at all, and I expect, Tom, you may be talking perhaps about hedgerow trees, but they're really vital um, components to all our hedges. I mean, every good hedge should have a few standard trees scattered along its length. And that's where tree wardens can play a particular role, I think, in encouraging those trees not just to be retained, but new ones to grow. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, then we shall move on and uh, hand over to Tom, who will be talking about uh, uh, hedge management. So over to you, Tom. Rob, if you if you want to, there are a few questions actually in the chat, so do have a look at those in your own time and, and uh, answer those if you like. But uh, until then, over to Tom, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I'm Tom Hines, and like Rob, uh, about 30 years ago, I bought a small farm in North Devon. Um, I had been keen on hedges and hedge laying for many years, having worked as a contractor in Kent. Um, I've run many training courses, encouraging people to learn the traditional skills of hedge management. Um, and I think all through my time of working for Devon County Council, I was lucky enough to be able to run these courses for the county under various guises within their countryside management sections. Um, so I'm very much going to be talking about management. I should be following up some of the things that um, Rob has uh, already mentioned, but obviously he's introduced it nicely to say hedges are terribly important for wildlife, terribly important for landscape um, and terribly important for culture. But the way that you manage them um, will affect um, will affect how good they are for all those purposes. 
I thought we'd just start off with looking at what are what is the condition of Devon's hedges at the moment. Um, and according to recent comparatively recent research, 38% are in favourable condition. So I think anyone who goes up country would instantly spot um, the further they go from Devon generally the worse the condition of the hedges are. So we're very lucky here to have 38% in good condition. Um, I'm not quite sure how it relates to the other counties but it's certainly it's a good statistic. But when you look at why they're not in good condition or so-called favourable condition, the hedges that are failing are either because they're cut too frequently um, or not cut often enough to turn into a line of trees. So these are two conflicting um, problems for hedges. So it's overmanagement and lack of management. So how should they be managed? Um, at our Devon Hedge Group meeting yesterday, it was proposed that all hedges should be allowed to grow up to 12 years and then should be laid by somebody um, and allowed to grow up for another 12 years. Now, I'm definitely a realist. I would love to see this happening. It's what would have happened in the past many, many years ago. But nowadays, um, the flail is definitely the main method that hedges are managed. And I know they're very unpopular with the public. Um, and generally, they're popular with farmers. Um, and at the moment, all day today, I've had a, a flailing contractor cutting around me. Um, and I think generally doing a pretty good job. Um, but they're not the be all and end all of, cut, of, of managing hedges. Um, and I think there is a, there is a controversy or there, is a, there are two beliefs. I think many farmers would say, I would like my hedge cutting and hedge management to cost as little money as possible. And many conservationists would say, I would like my hedges to be as best possible for wildlife, which probably means bigger the better. Um, but hopefully through this talk, I will be able to show where there are where we can get a better balance between those two extremes. And obviously I'm not suggesting that all farmers want to see hedges um, cut short and small, and I'm not suggesting that all conservationists want to see them big and enormous. But there are the two attitudes, um, and we need to get a good balance between them. One of the ways of explaining hedge management is to look at this um, this picture drawn up by Nigel Adams from Hedgelink, which at the bottom has these green section, which is a nice circle looking at a healthy hedge. And it's, um, we can go round and round this circle, starting off at number four, just laid or coppiced or planted, going through to five when it grows up to 1.3, one to three meters high, at six growing taller, at seven growing taller, and then at some stage or other, we lay and cast, uh, lay the hedge and it gets back to stage four. And you can keep on going round and round like that forevermore and your hedge will stay in good condition. Obviously you can keep it at stage four. Um, you can keep it short by flailing it regularly. But at some stage or other, um, if you cut it too often, you may then go up the, the red route, going up to cut too often, you may end up at stage three. So hopefully we can have a look at some hedges that are on a good, healthy cycle, and we'll look at some that have gone into the red areas where either they're no good for wildlife or for farming because they've become um, very gappy, or they've become a line of trees and therefore aren't a hedge anymore. So I think we'd all agree that that's a poor quality hedge. Um, it's very gappy. It's very much looking like an umbrella on sticks. Um, all the growth is at the top. It's not dense or stock proof and it's somewhere in the stage two. 
Um, Hedge, like that one, is definitely, uh, again, one of the stage two hedges. Not only has it been badly managed and is no longer dense and stock proof, but the stock have gone through the Devon Hedge Bank um, and are starting to bring that down. So the future of the hedge is looking, looking very dubious. If we look at the other end, if you can see them, those that's a, a, a ewe and her lamb underneath a line of what is turning into a line of beech trees. So that's definitely somewhere in this sort of stage nine, seven metres high plus. So that's gone into the red area as well. Um, and the, that's probably gone beyond doing anything apart from leaving it to a line of trees. But going back, to the shorter hedges. There we have the typical hedge cut once a year in the autumn. Um, and the consequence is it looks quite nice. That is blackthorn flowering time, and it is a blackthorn dominated hedge. And you can see, although there are a couple of bits of misty flowers there, the majority of it is not flowering. And if it doesn't flower, it won't be so good for insects, it won't be so good for um, slows in the autumn, um, and generally it won't be as good for wildlife as you would have hoped. If you allow it to grow up a bit more, this has probably had three, two or three years growth. It's then going to be flowering and set seed because many of the species um, of a Devon hedge will flower on old wood. So they need to grow for more than a year in order to flower and set seed. And something of that size will produce um, some reasonable crops. It won't produce the maximum number of flowers, but it will produce a reasonable crop. And the advantage of that is that you can still cut it with a flail. Um, it is amazing how uh, what size can easily be cut without damaging the hedges a hedge enormously. Now I said flails are controversial. This is a hedge at the end of my lane that was cut um, in March, whatever it says, I can't read. Um, and I think most people would say, well, that was a fairly brutal attack of this hedge using a flail. Um, I wasn't too concerned about it, but I was pleased to see that a few months later it looked like that. And it's grown back very well subsequently over the next few years, and is now a nice uh, big tall hedge overgrown, not obstructing the road too much and good for wildlife. But of course it is getting bigger and bigger, so it will reach the stage where something more dramatic needs to be done. Um, I was, was saying that when you leave a hedge to grow up a certain amount, you will get fantastic flowers on it. There's a beautiful blackthorn hedge. You probably could cut that with a flail. Um, I think it may be just getting beyond its limit and that's probably got five or seven years growth on it. Um, that one is one of mine. I am leaving it to grow up um, because obviously I, I like my tall hedges um, and I can cope with them. Now that hedge, how old does anybody think, well not how old is the hedge, but how when was that last cut? Now I'm lucky enough to have been here for 30 years, so I know that this hedge um, hasn't been cut for 30 years. So it's about, um, I would guess, six meters tall um, and is obviously, or even though it's fenced with a rather poor quality fence, the stock have been in there. The willow has grown enormously. It's got very uh, open at the base base and um, in terms of management if I leave it much longer it's going to be a very very difficult job to do anything with. So three winters ago I started laying the hedge so this is the same hedge um, and you can see the standard trees that I've left behind um, which are the original size of the hedge but this is this willow section so all I've done is I've cut out the biggest material and I have created a hinge, at, <clears throat> excuse me, 
a hinge at the base of each of the stems so that I can bring the stem over in true Devon style, leaving it tight on top of the bank um, where it will grow back and create this dense, thick stock roof barrier that you can't even get a dog through. Um, only my dog loves to be up in the middle of the hedge all the time. Um, and so this is hedge laying or steeping as it's often referred to in Devon. Now, because the Devon hedge is rather different um, to most hedges, because it involves the bank as well, after you've steeped your hedge, the correct technique is to take the soil from the bottom of the bank and cast it up. So casting up is the technical term um, and put it on top of the bank, partly so that um, you retain the bank and its height and partly so that you lower the height of the field and make a more stock proof barrier. And you can see there that I've put in um, probably into the middle of the hedge, I've probably put in one foot six, possibly even two foot of um, soil to build the bank up to a reasonable height where it had been um, knocked back by stock. You'll see there are some nice uh, bluebells growing in a hedge. I've tried to do a subtle job not to get rid of them altogether by burying them too deeply. Um, and where, where possible, um, I, they have survived through the experience and the hedge is growing back very nicely now. So this is the um, traditional technique. Any of you who've seen James Revilius's wonderful photographs of hedges may well know this a very nice picture of Mr. Squire of Dalton um, laying his hedge, having his breakfast, leaning up against the hedge. This is my recreation um, of that photograph. It's obviously not as good as the James Revilius, but is the modern version of it. Um, I love to use a, Dev a swing shovel for casting up. I do occasionally use a Devon shovel, but I'm sure many of you will have used Devon shovels and will know just how much hard work it is to cast up merely using a shovel. So hats off to those in the past that did it all by hand. So if you look through the stages, these are all the same section of hedge. A 30 year old hedge brought back into management um, and now dense, stock proof, good for wildlife. Uh, my plan is to leave it for another 30 years. I've obviously left hedgerow trees to grow on. Um, and hopefully that hedge uh, has been suitably managed. Now, why does everyone not do this? This is perhaps one of the questions that comes first to mind. Again, it comes down to expense. How much time is anyone willing to spend? Um, obviously, I enjoy my hedge laying enormously. Rob was talking about community groups, um, and I know lots of people who love going out hedge laying, and it's satisfying. I was recently quoted as saying, you turn something messy, a messy hedge, into a neat and tidy hedge. And my wife told me off for saying this because Obviously, as Rob would be the first to agree, messy is it's quite important in the countryside and we don't want it to be over tidied up. But I think what I was trying to say was there is a certain mentality where you can change an overgrown hedge into a beautiful laid hedge and really enjoy that satisfaction. So it's expensive. If you get a contractor in, in the past, it was thought you might lay a chain a day and a chain is around 20 meters. So here we have a contractor on, um, uh, on Exmoor who's managing to lay 40 meters a day. So twice the national or, or the expected average. And the reason he's doing that is the hedge is in perfect condition for that. So one of the compromises we could go for is for people to be confident that there is a hedge laying contractor locally who in year 12 to 15 will come along, quote a reasonable price and lay the hedge beautifully. Um, and the farmer then has saved 12 to 15 years of hedge cutting costs. And it may then be quite an economic thing to do. Rob's already talked about um, hedge trees and 
um, the Hedge Group ran a competition recently, encouraging people to, to be proud of the hedgerow trees they've established. And this is the winner of the competition. He'd been establishing trees on his farm for many years and was a great promoter of them. A lot of farmers might say that hedgerow trees cause gaps. Uh, one of the ways around it is to not have low branches on your hedgerow trees. And you can see this farmer has taken off all the low branches to allow the light into the hedges underneath so that they remain stock proof. But if uh, obviously we have ash dieback at the moment, if we are to retain even even before ash dieback came along, we needed to do something like 2000 replacement trees every year which equated to each farm um, replacing one tree every three or four years. So it isn't a huge commitment, but everyone needs to do their bit. And we as the Devon Hedge Group need to keep on raising awareness of the fact that hedgerow trees are incredibly important. Rob has already talked about climate change and he's talked about this 40% um, increase in the uh, extent of hedges. One of the things that I would say new hedgerow trees could help to do this 40% increase. So it is a really important thing. How we encourage farmers to do this, I'm not sure, but um, we need financial incentives, definitely. Um, and we need more understanding of the fact that of just how beneficial they are. The flail, of course, is not the only way you can manage hedges. There are various other options. A rotary saw doesn't make such a mess and can be used very effectively at cutting uh, bigger material, but you still have to clear the big material up. And Rob talking about firewood, you know, this could be a useful method of coppicing a hedge so that you can produce firewood from it. Hedgerow shears were developed in the forestry indus industry and basically hold on to your steeper, cut, cut through it, or your coppice material, cut through it, still hold on to the, the stem, and then you could wood, use it for wood chip, put it straight into a wood chipper, or you could just thin your hedge accordingly and then lay it with a chainsaw afterwards. There are, there are various techniques available which could be useful. I thought I ought to just finish um, to say that obviously management isn't only about the shrubby material at the top. We have many stone-faced hedges. They need management as well. Here we have a group of unemployed on some recent scheme or perhaps a further, uh, further more distant scheme. They're a very hardworking bunch. Well, either they're a hardworking bunch or I said to all of them, pretend you're working hard and I'll take your photograph. Um, and they all pretended they worked very, very hard, a good bunch. I took some students out recently to do some um, stone-faced hedging. So this is repairing a hedge on the edge of Exmoor, starting off looking like that, finishing off with all those rather redder stones looking like that. Again, very expensive in terms of time, but wonderfully satisfying and really good to see the product. I'm just gonna finish off by reminding everyone that there is the Devon Hedge Award this year, which is looking at um, rewarding anyone who's managing their hedges for the benefit of flowers, nuts, fruits, and berries. Um, and you can apply for this award. There's a simple application form on the website. Send in a couple of photographs. We'll then in return send you a nice certificate to, um, to, to say thank you for the good work that you're doing and a little plaque that you can put on a farm gate or on a garden gate. Um, and I've just used this lovely photograph of some holly berries um, and I put it on the Devon Hedge Group Facebook page and to raise awareness of the award scheme. I just spoke to my wife um, to say, I, I took this photograph on uh, Saturday, I think, and she said she saw a whole flock of red wings had just moved into this hedge because they roost in the hedge and then they feed in our orchard. And the next time I looked at this holly berries, every single ho holly berry had been stripped by the red wings. 
Um, and it's interesting that the Red Wings, going back to Rob's bit about the wildlife, the Red Wings are going for the holly berries before they're going for the hawthorn berries, which is something I didn't know. But it just goes to show how important an overgrown hedge is for wildlife. But equally, just to sum it up, um, you can bring them back into good conditions. There are ways of bringing them back. We need more support for farmers so that they can effectively manage them. Um, so that we have beautiful hedges, some of which are tall, some of which are short, all of which are suitably managed for a long time into the future. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom. That's that was absolutely fascinating as well. Um, I just realised that I have established my own hedge in the new garden that we've recently moved into a new house last week and uh, thinking maybe I should enter it into the Devon Hedge Wards, but it is only, it's just, it's all horn beam and it's mostly been put in to block out noisy neighbours. So maybe there needs to be a separate award for effectiveness of blocking out sound, but I've probably got a few years to go yet. <laughs> Not great for biodiversity just at the moment, but um, anyway. <laughs> Brilliant. So do we have any questions for Tom about uh, hedge management? Any in the chat that I've missed? Let's expand that up. I see Peter wants to ask a question. Oh, Peter, yes, go ahead. Just unmute. Yes, um, I'm a volunteer wildlife warden for ACT, Action for Climate in Timbridge. And this year I'm intending to run a hedge laying course for some of the wildlife wardens. Um, now, my favourite method is the Midland Bullock. Um, and of course, for that, I need stakes and heathers. Do you have any, or Tom, do you know any where, where I can get stakes and headers? I don't mind cutting them myself. Um, 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 presumably, uh, presumably the hedge that you're going to be working on does not include a bank? That's right. Um, stakes and headers, I, I don't know of anyone particular. Um, you could easily ask on either the Devon Hedge Group forum or the Devon Hedge Group Facebook site, because I know the Facebook site has a lot of woodworkers who are members of it, and somebody might well know of a suitable hazel coppice that you could cut your material from. Right. Thank you. Andrew Lamming. Yes, it's actually Jane, but yes. Oh, hi, Jane. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I might have missed this at the beginning because I was a few minutes late, but if one wanted to plant a hedge, because at the moment I've got um, an area of, basically it's all bramble down at, down at uh, the side of a field in my, on my land. Um, if one wanted to plant a Devon hedge, what would be the ideal makeup? I would very much go for what grows well in your locality. Um, so look at other hedges that are there and try and copy those. But one of the things that um, both Rob and I have been doing presentations on recently is very much consider what it is you're trying to achieve with planting this hedge. If the only interest is a stock roof barrier, then something that's thorny is probably going to be very good. If your main interest is uh, you're wanting to coppice it at some stage in the future for firewood, then you would want faster growing and willow may be the one that you want to dominate your hedge. But I think any new hedge, very important to think about what, your, what the function of that hedge is. Um, and if you want one, something that's multi-purpose, so it's going to produce some firewood, it's going to be good for wildlife, it's going to produce some good stock, uh, stock proofness, go for a, a good mixture. Um, the Hedge Group website has some good advice on new hedge planting and hedge choice of species. But as you go across the county, it will vary very much according to where you are. So I'd have a look at the Hedge Group web website. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Well, if you do have any more questions, then of course you can put them in the chat if they do come to you. Of course, um, Sophie would like to ask a question. Oh, Sophie, go ahead. Um, hi, thank you very much. It's really interesting, Tom. Um, I'm in East Devon, um, a little bit like the, the previous question. We're trying to, to recreate and improve the, the hedge borders to our own land. Um, but I'm a bit stuck on creating the bank. I mean, do I need to create an actual bank first or should I get the, the, the trees established a bit first and then do it traditionally by then over overlaying with this with the soil you you have two options for establishing a new devon hedge either say yes i'm going to go for establishing the bank and go for a traditional one in which case definitely start with the bank um, use your local material so uh, hedges have always been made from the nearest material so you have you'll have a bit of a ditch or the, the land will go down a bit and then it'll go up for the for the bank leave your hedge to settle for a bit because you're if you're going to plant new saplings on top of the hedge it's as difficult to get them growing there as anywhere you can imagine because it's a bit dry it's very difficult to access it may well have weeds um, and it is generally quite a difficult job to do so bear in mind that some weed control over the first year would be good um, and try and um, keep the weeds down as much as possible because they will suck up water faster than your saplings will. So a difficult job, but my recommendation would be get in with a machine, put in a bank, leave it a year, and then do your planting afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Victoria's iPad. Do you have a question? If you are trying to speak, I think you might be muted. Hi, um, I'm just thinking about climate change and um, is this going to have any effect on what will successfully grow in new hedges? And if so, should we be looking at hedging that successfully grows in warmer climates? And what would you suggest? One of the things that I meant to say when I talked about hedgerow trees um, was that climate change is an issue and that what grows in the future may well be different to what we have at the moment. And one of the things that I've um, I've been involved with the pledge for nature run by the North Devon Biosphere Reserve and my pledge for nature was to increase the diversity of hedgerow trees that I have on the farm. So I've been looking at all sorts of other things. Field maple, for instance, does not occur naturally on the farm. Um, so that's one of the ones that I've chosen. But I've also chosen apple trees because um, they don't need to be carefully managed as they would be in an orchard. I'm only growing them for the apples that are produced and if they're small and the red wings and the field fairs love them, I'm very happy with that. But again, something you wouldn't necessarily expect to see as a hedgerow tree. But crab apples grow very well and will be wonderful for wildlife, but there's no reason why you shouldn't have a domest domesticated one as well. So my conclusion would be, yes, go for um, a broad variety of potentially useful trees in the, for the future um, because of climate change. And tree diseases as well. I mean, looking at ash dieback, you know, we've, we've got a huge problem there. We are going to have so many less ash trees in the future. We need to look at the broadest possible um, choice of species. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, I think I'm having trouble seeing hands popping up. Are there any more hands out there that I can't see? Um, I've just uh, was going to yes. ask a question again. Whether there are any grants available for, should we say, domestic um, domestic hedge planting? If you're not running to acres and acres of land, you know, 
Simple answer is probably no, um, but bear in mind that the hedge will establish much better the smaller the material that you plant. One of the things that we were discussing in the hedge group meeting yesterday was that there are so many initiatives for trees to be planted across the whole of the country that we are going to be short of trees from tree nurseries. So my recommendation would be is get in early um, because we will run out of trees because they take time to grow. If it's something small and domestic, why not think about growing something yourself? Um, autumn is a good time to collect seeds. They are, some of them are amazingly easy to grow. Um, and I'm hoping that the Devon Hedge Group website will have a bit more guidance or possibly links to other people that have good recommendations of how to grow trees yourself. Um, because I think we are all going to suffer this problem that we can't get the trees that we want. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, could, could I just come in there and say that, that there are some sources of trees and funding available. I, I would look at the Woodland Trust, the Tree Council, and also the Saving Devon Treescapes project. The last project is uh, run and managed by the Devon Wildlife Trust on behalf of the Ash Dieback Forum, but they were certainly making free trees available. So there are a number of different avenues to explore there. Thank you. We can maybe put some links in the chat or something later on. Absolutely can. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, I think we'll, we'll leave it there for the time being. So if you've got any more questions, do put them in the chat. Uh, but we, we do need to move on. So uh, we'll move on to the final talk, which is from uh, Megan Gimber about hedge surveying. I forgot to carelessly forgot to mention that she's representing People's Trust for Endangered Species. So um, I shall hand you over to Megan uh, to talk about uh, hedge surveys. Over to you, Megan. Right. Hopefully you can all see a picture, <clears throat> a picture of me in a hedge. Is that what you can all see? Can you give me a thumbs up just in case? Brilliant. Okay, so um, I am Megan Gimber. Uh, I work for a conservation charity called People's Trust for Endangered Species. Sorry to stop you there, Megan. I, th I think you're in a slight different mode where you can see your notes. Is that is okay. that the present presenter yeah. mode? Is it or? Yeah, it's in presenter mode. It should be. Hold on, let me have it. Should a be good. Go. I think. That... Let's have a look. See if we can. Ah, bang on. There we go. Got it. Uh, uh, That's fine that? as it is. No, no, it's fine the first time round. <laughs> Is that still is that still presenter mode? Yes, when you first put it up, then it was it was in the right mode. It was the uh, the full screen, and then you click something, and now it's gone into the the notes form. Ah, oh, that is funny because normally it does allow you to share with notes. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. This is odd. I'll tell you what. I will just try and give my presentation without notes <laughs> How about that um so hopefully i won't ramble too long because giving giving a presentation without notes sometimes i do i do go off on one instead. oh you'll be fine you'll be fine um, <laughs> let's see okay so so that's me um buried in a hedge um i work for a conservation charity called people's trust for endangered species um i grew up on a, a farm in east devon um though not a farmer i laid my first hedge at the age of about seven uh, although I would definitely still consider myself a beginner hedge layer. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about hedge surveying. So a little bit about why we think it's a good idea to survey hedges, a bit about the theory about how, how we do it and why, um, and then an introduction to the two surveys that we, that we run. So from this view, I can't actually move my slides along. Oh. Well, we could go back to the view if that, that, that would be fine if it's not going to shift. Uh, let me see if I can do this one more time. It's fiddly, isn't it? I've, I'm still trying to get, get used to using Zoom. I'm much more familiar <laughs> with Teams, so it does Sorry. throw me sometimes. <laughs> See if I can. Oh, 
I'll tell you what, I will do portion of screen. How about that? Now can you just see a picture of me in the hedge? Yep. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so um, um, we've heard from Rob already about how amazing hedges are for, for wildlife. Um, in fact, George Eustace recently described them as the single most important ecological building block left in this country. Um, and as far as I see it, they provide three large roles for wildlife. So firstly, they provide a physical home. So nesting birds, hibernating hedgehogs, dormice, um, and all the like. Secondly, they're an excellent complementary habitat. So one that might not, not necessarily be home, um, but plays an important role in life. So this can be for food, um, such as leaves, flowers, berries, um, or insects, or it could be shelter. So a good indication of this is, um, 84% of our farmland indicator birds utilize hedges, but actually it's only half of them that use hedges as their primary primary habitat. The rest use them as a, as a complementary habitat. So for shelter and for food. Um, and lastly, they are a route of passage. They um, connect up, um, they act like corridors, connecting up populations that would otherwise be um, isolated and vulnerable. So this is important for things like dormice, for bats, um, for flying insects like butterflies and moths, um, uh, and all sorts of all sorts of creatures that, that really do need these corridors um, to travel through the countryside. Uh, but obviously, some hedges are in better shape than others. Um, and as Tom mentioned, um, the management that they see has a huge impact um, on their structure and so their capacity to sustain wildlife. Um, and even their capacity to act as effective wildlife corridors. Um, so the level of fragmentation that we see in this hedge here obviously makes it near impossible for any animals to use this hedge for any of their three main uses really. Um, so I'll say we, we did go through some dark decades of incentivized hedgeway removal after the war um, and nationally we lost up to 50%. So I think Devon, the, the, the average of Devon loss was slightly lower than that, um, partly because of the, the, the way that um, Devon, Devon's farming is still sort of small mixed farming, lots of pastoral farming, um, potentially because the banks made removal a little bit more challenging at the time as well. Um, but we did still see quite a lot of hedgerow loss in these decades. Um, and you can actually 